My name is uh, Aman Jafar. I am uh, associate professor of sociology here uh, at LUMS. And it is really my great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this, um, uh, both a book launch, uh, but I think also a celebration in many ways uh, of the distinctive contributions of uh, Alan Taz's uh, contributions to uh, architecture uh, in Lahore and elsewhere in Pakistan. Um, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce the panel. We'll have uh, uh, Dr. Chris uh, Moffat, who is the author of uh, The Time of Building. The book is uh, right here. I believe there are copies available uh, in that uh, part of the room as well. Um, and um, Dr. Chris Moffat is, and so he will speak uh, initially for about 25 20, 20 minutes. 20 minutes yeah. um, then uh, Professor Nagra uh, Khan will um, offer some comments, and then we will also invite uh, Kamil Saab to, to say a few words. So let me introduce um, two of our speakers. I don't think Amazon needs to be introduced. In fact, I think the entire <laughs> conversation is going to be uh, a very, uh, uh, you know, an examination of his uh, life and work. Um, so let me introduce uh, Dr. Moffat, who is a senior uh, lecturer uh, in history at the Queen Mary University uh, in London. Uh, he is, he has been for the last few years now shifted his attention to, uh, to architecture in, in Pakistan. And um, you know, I've read a number of a series of his uh, articles on the subject, looking at Khan uh, Saab's work, uh, Yasmin Lali Saiba's work is also uh, something that he's published on. Um, and I think one of the big lacunae in our uh, sort of scholarship in Pakistan in terms of architecture of Pakistan, you know, he really is, is making some very interesting uh, contributions to fill that. Um, Dr. Nadra Shabazz Khan, who will be uh, commenting on this book, uh, is Associate Professor of Art and Architectural History uh, here at LUMS. She's also Director of the Gurbani Center. Uh, her most recent book is um, on Mahan Raja Ranjit Singh's uh, Samadhi in Lahore. Um, and also she teaches a course on Mughal architecture. I think many of the students uh, from that course are also here. So thank you for, um, for joining us and allowing your class uh, time to be taken up by, by this particular uh, session. And like I said, Kamal Khan Kuntaz Saab, we'll have a great introduction to him. By the end of this, I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> and over thanks to uh, Chris. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Amin, for that um, really warm introduction and for the invitation to be here. Um, it's a really great uh, privilege and pleasure to be back at LUMS after uh, a number of years um, and to see some old friends in the audience and to, to meet new ones. Um, so uh, I'm really grateful to Nadra for agreeing to comment on the, the, the book. Um, and it's a particular pleasure to uh, have Kamal Saab here um, after very many years putting this book together and to be able to celebrate it um, together in, in person. So thank you for that. Um, so I wanted to just open the discussion a bit today by setting some of the context of this book, uh, which is um, being distributed by uh, Folio Books. They've been very um, wonderful and supportive in, in getting the book out. And its pr principal um, uh, function, as, as I'll say a little bit more about, has been uh, for use in libraries and for architectural students in particular, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, I wanted to place the book in context of some of the wider research I've been doing that Amin um, mentioned into histories of architecture in Pakistan. And I'm going to do this by talking through, um, let's see if I can get this working, three things, so architecture, archives, and time. So, um, again, as Amin mentioned, since uh, about 2017, 2018, I've been doing some research into um, histories of architecture uh, in Lahore. And my specific focus is on what I call Pakistan's first properly post-colonial generation of architects, right? So people who were born around the time of partition, who came of age in Pakistan, uh, who set up their practices in Pakistan in the 1960s, 70s, even if many of them, like Kamosab, had been trained abroad in the UK, in the US, um, also in uh, figures of this generation were trained in Turkey and Lebanon. And these architects came of age uh, in a time of, or came, 
set, founded their practices in a time of quite considerable social and political upheaval. We had the protests um, that uh, led to the downfall of Ayub Khan in the late 1960s. We had um, the, the breakup of East Pakistan and the, the, the break off of East Pakistan and the formation of Bangladesh. They have also been engaged not only in um, uh, architectural work, but also in heritage work, in educational work. Um, and today, figures from that generation, so Kamal Khanumtaz, who we're celebrating today, but also Yasmin Lari, Nairali Dada, Araf Hassan, um, Yasmin Chima, Pervez Vandal, these, these figures um, are among the most eminent members of the profession. Um, but almost nothing has been written about their work or academically, right? Um, and Nothing has been sort of examined about the particular contributions they've made to Pakistan's built environment, uh, about the um, challenges they faced, and, and also the question of what architects today can learn from, from this history. So there is this kind of general um, absence in the historiography, but also two more specific reasons that I'm interested in this, this group of architects um, who are very internally differentiated, I should say. They're all kind of very different from each other, but belong to the same historical moment. Um, first, they allow us to place Pakistan within a wider global history, um, which we were talking about before, about the kind of crisis in architectural modernism, right? There's this um, uh, shift, again, from the, the 1960s and 1970s, um, where that, that hope from the early 20th century that architects might be able to create a new world, right? Um, using new technologies and new aesthetics, that, that hope is starting to collapse, right? It, the contradictions are starting to show. Um, and we see architects increasingly concerned with um, what has been, the question of what has been left behind by modernism's in vernacular methods, in the particularities of place in particular, and how that should affect architectural practice. So that's the first reason why I think this generation is, is, is interesting in terms of a kind of global architectural history. The second is that this generation's interest in the local, in the vernacular, in questions of place means that they are engaging with debates over what sort of country Pakistan is, right? Or what kind of country it should be. And specifically, they're, quest they're engaging questions about the power and presence of the past uh, in Pakistan's present, right? Um, questions about what histories matter, what histories count, how we recover those histories, whether it's through archaeology, whether it's through resuscitating um, continuing traditions uh, of building practice and architectural design. So my work wants to take architects like Kamal Saab um, seriously as thinkers. Right? as philosophers of history, and I know Kamal doesn't like that uh, when I describe uh, him in that way, but these are um, figures who are navigating very important questions of community, of identity, uh, and history through practices of designing and making and building. Right? Um, but they've never really been treated this way in the historiography. And I should say here that I'm not trained as an architect, I'm not even trained as an architectural historian, uh, I'm interested uh, in ideas, in the history of ideas. And so that also explains my particular path um, uh, into this project. Um, as a historian, I am deeply reliant on documentary, uh, uh, documentary kind of relics or fragments of, of these histories. And so I want to say a little bit about archives um, as the second point of setting the context for this work. So while papers related to architectural practice in, uh, I guess, the colonial period in Lahore in particular are relatively uh, accessible, both in Lahore, um, or also in, in, in the former imperial metropole in London, right? There is no dedicated, publicly accessible collection of documents related to architecture after independence in Pakistan. Right? So the things that you might expect to find in such an archive, whether there are drawings or photographs, um, correspondence between architects and clients, site documentation, um, these sorts of things, they're dispersed across uh, very different collections, whether they are personal um, archives of architects in their, associated with their offices, um, they might be uh, difficult to access in state collections that have not yet been made public, um, they may have simply been destroyed or not 
deemed not worth uh, um, holding on to, right? And again, this is not just a, a question of um, architectural history, right? This is something that has been noted by scholars of other aspects of um, um, Pakistan's history, whether this is film histories, right? It's also a, a challenge that historians face in general um, in, in Pakistan and uh, many other places in the world. But looking at histories of architecture, for me, this, consider, this created um, considerable obstacles during the research. Um, I spent months and months in Lahore kind of going around different uh, architectural offices, looking for papers, anything that had kind of survived from the 60s, 70s, 80s. I was going through municipal and provincial archives for anything related to the built environment. I spent a lot of time looking at newspapers for just mentions of uh, debates around planning and architecture. Um, but oral histories, such as that is reproduced in, in this book, The Time of Building, um, as well as site visits, documentation, speaking to people who live in some of the buildings that I'm interested in, became really important. So this question of kind of generating one's own archive um, uh, became important. But this absence of um, a dedicated, publicly accessible archive devoted to architecture and its histories, which, um, again, isn't necessarily something that exists um, in other places, although you're starting to see, um, especially in South Asia, uh, architectural schools collating um, documentation, like the NCA has begun doing it here in Lahore as well. Um, um, but this absence of something that is kind of widely open to the public, widely accessible, has implications not just for the histories we tell about architecture, but also, I think, the practice of architecture um, in the present, right? Um, the post-colonial generation uh, that, I, that I've been speaking about are responsible for a body of work that is characterized by experiment, by innovation, by collaboration, by some really careful thinking about climate and context and the way a building is used, the way buildings are um, uh, uh, change over time, right? And I don't mean to you know, say this in a singularly celebratory way, right? There's also uh, challenges and failures that we can learn from um, as, as architects like Kamasab will, will, you know, um, is quite open with talking about his own work and his own kind of progression um, into um, what works and what doesn't work into the present, right? So this was, um, this idea of kind of capturing this history, of making it accessible was the seed for this book, The Time of Building, um, as well as a wider project around architectural archives, which I'll say a bit about in a moment. But um, I started talking with Kamasad, asking, you know, rather than simply collecting these oral histories and um, photographs and documents for my own research, uh, how might some of these things be made more widely accessible, um, presented to spark discussion, not just about the history of architecture, but also about the challenges that architects in Pakistan face today. And so because um, Kamal Saab has such a, um, I mean, I learned so much from earlier discussions with him, but he's also so invested in thinking historically um, that it seemed uh, a kind of natural choice to pursue this. Um, Kamal is the author of the only existing comprehensive history of building practices in, in Pakistan um, in his 1985 book, Architecture in Pakistan, um, which you can download for free, I believe, from uh, ARCnet, A-R-C-H-net. Um, for Kamal, the past is not simply behind us, it's not over, but something that continues to weigh on the present, that continues to structure something, the history that must be critically engaged in the present and towards uh, the future. Right? And I also recorded, recruited two other uh, collaborators um, for this project. One is the designer, Kiran Ahmed, um, who took as her brief the design of a sort of portable archive, um, something inspired by the bureaucratic conventions of, a, of what we consider to be an invention, a conventional archive, um, but is obviously also transcending it. And then second, and he didn't mention this in his introduction, but Aman Jaffer, um, who has written the afterwards uh, to the book, um, and Aman's parents commissioned um, Kamal Saab to build him a home in Model Town in, um, when, when uh, Aman was, was a, a young man. And uh, I wanted him to bring his kind of ethnographer's eye to the, to the space of living, as, as, as the chapter is called, um, and think again about buildings in use and how we actually 
um, architectural histories are not just about those who build and make and design buildings, but also those who inhabit and, and use them. Um, so the book which we're celebrating today uh, reproduces sections from uh, a long conversation with Kamal um, that uh, he and I had in, uh, at the end of 2020, which seems like a while ago now. Um, it's illustrated with documents, photographs. Yeah, you can kind of just scroll through. Um, and drawings, some, are which, some of which are from Kamal, Kamal's own collections. And I'm grateful to Kamal's office and Temur, um, his son, for, for facilitating this. Um, others are from the NCA archives such as this reference letter from Fez Emmet Fez for Kamal's first job at MCA, um, from the Architectural Association um, in London, where Kamal Saab studied, and elsewhere, and some from various architects um, and photographers who kindly gave me their permission to reproduce their photographs and, and drawings. So uh, as I said, the kind people at Folio have been um, helping me to distribute this print book, which um, We've been giving to architectural schools and libraries uh, free of charge. Um, and the book is also available for a free PDF download at architecturalarchives.com. Um, so we are actually selling the book here to, um, tonight um, for 1,500 rupees, which is less than it costs to print. Um, so please do speak to Fatima, um, who's here from Folio, if you're, if you're interested. Um, I just want to say something about this website before I kind of move towards conclusion, which is still in a test version. So if you look at this website now, some parts are met, uh, noted as under development. And I'm actually in Lahore to work with some students at NCA and Beacon House and the architectural schools to um, develop some of the toolkits that, um, that we've been putting together around archiving architecture's histories. Um, so the website is not itself an archive, but rather a prompt to think about what a dedicated, publicly accessible archive for architecture and for histories um, of architecture in Pakistan might look like. So one of the limitations is that it focuses overwhelmingly on an architect, right? On Kamal Khan Mumtaz um, as the protagonist of an architectural history. And this is, of course, a long-standing tendency of the discipline of architectural history, where monographs are often devoted to the careers of individuals, of, of particular practices, um, tracing their developments in their portfolio over time. But architecture is a complex material practice. It produces complex material forms. It's not simply concerned with design and the communication of a, of a vision to a builder and a client, but also uh, navigates the intricacies of a site, um, the contingencies of buildings, the unpredictable dynamics of dwelling, of, build, of, of using or living in a building, right? Architectural evidence, as the historian Anuradha Ayer Siddiqui reflects, is polyvalent and polyphonic. Polyvalent and polyphonic, meaning it, it, it's uh, multiple sounds, multiple voices, right? The diversity of architecture as an object and a practice reflects the diversity of history itself. And here is how I put the problem in um, the introduction to this book. Who and what else must be considered in our archives of the built environment? In this book, builders and craftsmen appear crucial. But what about a building's clients, its residents, its visitors, or users? Beyond human actors, can we also archive a site's geography, its climate, the incursions of flora and fauna, a building's connections or disconnections from infrastructure or surrounding environments? the passing of traffic. What about the saints who, according to the Sufi tradition, uh, continue to inhabit the Mazar? This is the Baba Hassan Deen um, shrine in Bhagmanpur that Kamal Khan um, Mumtaz designed and which is kind of important to the book um, as a whole. So the problem is not simply that architecture should have an archive, but also that architecture challenges our idea, our idea of what an archive could or should be, right? What kind of things it contains, at least as we conventionally understand it. Um, and these are some of the problems, again, that I'm kind of working through on this site. I encourage you to have a look um, and download the book. Um, um, but one of the things that I wanted to point out today is that these are things that Kamal Saab gives us a lot of um, um, food for thought around, ways of thinking about this. And, and so I'll just turn to the last question, which is about why we chose the title, The Time of Building. And I just want to kind of parse a bit of this here. Now, 
Kamasab was initially uncertain about uh, this title. I'm still not sure if he <laughs> entirely likes it, but he preferred something that was closer to communicating his vision, something like continuing tradition, right, which we talked about um, in the book. Um, but I was convinced that the time of building uh, helped to capture not just where Kamasab arrived in his practice, but also where he began, that contrast between the generative time of modernism that I mentioned, this kind of pursuit of something new, and the recursive time of tradition. Um, Kama's movement from seeing architecture as the production of something new to uh, the realization of existing truths in, in structure and form. And the phrase, the time of building, uh, also is useful, I think, to illuminate a more general um, sense that, a more general sense in the way that Mumtaz is, is deeply engaged with the time in which design and construction takes place, right? His approach to architecture is premised on a sense of responsibility to the present, the kind of time he is building in, um, but also to the future, the question of how a building will be inhabited over time, how it will be used and how it will endure the passage of time. So this is evident from his earliest experiments um, in housing, and we document in, in the 1960s after his return to Pakistan from Ghana and from the UK. Um, but it becomes more pressing in the 21st century, I think, as the architect grapples with Pakistan's place on, on the front lines of global climate change. And it's this sensitivity to the time of building um, that allows us to confront those polyvocal and polyphonic aspects of architecture's histories in the wider world that I mentioned. Um, we move beyond simply focusing about design, and, um, but into questions of context, of construction, and, and use. Kamasab's career and his approach helps us to challenge this myth of the architect's autonomy, right? This idea of the architect as coming from outside with a solution, being able to kind of define the environment around them. And instead, um, we see the architect navigating all manner of contingency, right? Engaging in cross-cutting collaborations with clients and builders, um, craftsmen. We also see buildings taking on new meanings and significance um, through use, through adaptation, through repair, um, and through their interaction with wider built environments. So there's an urgent need, I think, to, to capture and document and make public, publicly accessible some of these histories of architecture in Pakistan, not least because um, the built environment continues to, to uh, shift and expand around us. And any effort I want to kind of emphasize to do so will benefit from thinking broadly about what we mean by architectural evidence. And if um, this book you know, does, does anything amongst many, many things that I hope it will do, I hope one of them is, is to think about a prompt for that, what architectural histories could or should look like in, in Pakistan and elsewhere. So um, I'll finish there, I think, and pass to Nadra. Thank you, Chris. Assalamu alaikum. Um, it's an honor and a privilege uh, for me to be here and discuss a bit of this book. Um, let me say two things first. I will continue to refer to Kamil Saab um, as Kamil Saab and not as Mumtaz, as we generally do in, in, um, in scholarly writing, because the tradition that he is um, you know, defending and reintroducing requires me to, to do that. Uh, and the other thing is that 10 minutes um, was too short a time for me to squeeze everything that the book lays out in front uh, of us, but I'll try my best not to exceed that. And thank you, Aman and Razal for and Chris for um, you know giving me this opportunity. So the time of building Kamil Khan Mumtaz in architecture in Pakistan is an account that traces the search of an eminent Pakistani architect of making the buildings he designs to respond to not only his training and perceptions, but to the sensibilities of the people and the places they are created for. Our attention is drawn to several themes and sub-themes. Number one, time, as Chris has already talked about in its transient and historical senses, as an entity that promises change, but also the ability to hold its reins when needed. It is also presented as a device that transports you to the past, present and future, and philosophical perspectives to approach and engage with each one of them. The second most important theme is the man himself, 
whose personal, professional, and spiritual journeys it traces. Um, and broadly, the third is the story of Pakistan's architectural landscape, complete with its paths, winding through intersections of history and heritage, with a special focus on the war. Laid out in 11 chapters, the book offers an easy-to-follow order to track Kamilsav's footsteps, both in the empirical and theoretical senses, from his early childhood to the present day. The carefully researched facts and figures to support the material it presents, this dimension holds great value as archival material providing both textual and visual references of people, places, and publications in some of uh, these images that you've already seen and um, the other elements Chris has laid out lucidly. The strength of the book, I believe, comes from its design as an audio file converted into text, presenting two voices, that of Chris Moffat and Kamil Khan Muntar, a framework that reverberates with the tradition of Ustad and Shagir, the seeker of knowledge making the master share his experiences in a manner that is both revealing and instructive. While the format of the questions is calculated and formal, the voice of the Ustad is lifelike, frank and forthright. What this setup brings to the reader, or at least it brought to me, was the ease to slip in the author's seat from where this conversation becomes personal and direct. For each reader, therefore, turning the next page becomes a spontaneous act with the urge to not let the momentum break a framework subtly corresponding to the overarching themes of culture and traditions this book revolves around. Although the introduction lays out an overview of what the following chapters offer, the mystery of a modernist like Kamil Saab, tutored in the Western idiom from his very early days up to his master and his work experience in the past, Designing the Mazar of Baba Hassan Deen, a Sufi saint, and his disciple, Hafiz Iqbal, a thief, as well as his collaboration with hereditary craftsmen, unfolds in both concrete and abstract forms. This shift starts revealing itself in Chapter 6, where Kamil Saab shares his memories of embarking upon the voyage of discovering tradition and the wisdom it encompasses. A direct and profound influence we can find on him at this very early stage is that of a publication investigating the Sufi tradition in Persian architecture by Nadir Ardalan and Nadir Bakhtiar. An important concept that features prominently in this publication is that of Surat Vaman. What it translates as is that the form is never divorced from its meaning and that the meaning to these two authors, Ardalan and Bakhtiar, are, and I quote, none other than the spiritual, end quote. This is based on the idea that architecture is to serve human beings and cater to not only their physical, but also spiritual needs. Moffat calls the effect of this engagement, and I quote, the moment of epiphany for Kamisar as it brings a shift from Surat or the physical, embodied in the Western thought with an emphasis on excellence for the self taking place. A completely new dimension of approaching life and the built environment thus sets in. Contrary to the popular fascination of architecture exploiting fancy materials, innovative forms and fabrications, this approach is invested in its otherworldly dimension that have the potential to present ideas that can be experienced in perceptions. An interesting parallel to this discussion of phenomenology and functionalism versus the spirit of traditions, a concept also presented by David Leatherbarrow, chair of the graduate group in architecture at the University of Pennsylvania in several of his publications, especially in his book titled Architecture Oriented Otherwise, published in 2009, Leather Barrow points, posits that, and I quote, there are two ways designers and critics tend to view buildings. Number one, as objects 
that result from design and construction techniques, and techniques is in italics, stressing the term. And number two, as objects that represent various practices and ideas, end quote. The latter is clearly what has been Kamisar's primary pursuit. Under construction since 2001, the 22 years of the gradual growth of the Mazar of Baba Hassani, one of the case studies that this book introduces us to, is imbued with reverence for the deceased and the contentment of serving a spiritual cause that is timeless. As Margaret states, and I quote, for Mumtaz and his collaborators, the building is not simply a material shelter for physical remains, but a means to express and encounter a sense of the sacred." End quote. What this building hopes to achieve, he says, is the alternative way of inhabiting the world. A concept Baba Hassandin and Hafiz Iqbal spent their lives practicing and promoting. Modeled on Imam Ali's shrine in Najaf, Iraq, this adapted design recalls the 8th century original monument and its modifications up to the 17th century by the Safavids. And now it comfortably stands in Bhagwanpura, Lahore, as part of the city's 21st century architectural creation. Kamisad's representation of the Najaf shrine thus is metaphorical. It is not meant to express itself, but to recall, again, I use the same term, alternative way of inhabiting the world. A concept he explains at length towards the end of the book as his response to the existential crisis of today, a must read. Some of the other dimensions of this publication are a variety of contemporary issues related to heritage, conservation, and development, especially focusing on the war. The spirit of Kamisar's activism is woven into the length and breadth of this book that invites emulation and generates sentiments of admiration. Starting with his first tour of the walled city of Lahore, his efforts to conserve and promote it against all odds, and his continued struggle to wash away people's ignorance at different public forums, kindle a special response in the reader that has the potential to inspire action. All in all, this book will definitely find its way onto undergraduate and graduate reading lists for art and architectural and related theory and practice courses. Last but not least, Awan Jaffer's afterword sums up the discussion by providing a lived experience of one of Kamal Saab's creations. Laced with fond childhood memories, this is a tribute to the architect and his parents. This section offers an example of a built structure that responds to the expectations of the people inhabiting it, allowing them to reflect their identities and intellects through its sura, babani, its form and meanings, embodying the architect's vision and mission. The word tradition is presented in a variety of shapes and forms, and several traditional crafts are introduced in this book. Since the book is meant for the general public, may I humbly suggest that a glossary would have made it easier for readers to follow these terms. And I may ask uh, if uh, I'm allowed and I have the time to ask a question to come out towards the end. As, um, as stated in the book, masterpieces are looked at as sources of inspiration and are emulated with the addition of stamps of hair and now. It would be fascinating if, sir, you could please walk us through the Moti Masjid Delhi's parallel in the Park Riga Mosque that can help us understand both and highlight a few of its contemporary features that mark its unique temporal and spatial dimension. Thank you very much. The, the Moti Masjid that stands in the Delhi port, uh -huh. built by Aurangzeb, is now, you know, we have a parallel standing in Park Riga <laughs> location. So how does it help us recall what Aurangzeb commissioned and the architectural tradition? And how does it also have its own unique presence of being built in the 21st century? Huh. 
Well, uh, as with Baba Hasandin, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the reference to the uh, the the original uh, Moti Masjid, uh, in this case uh, Najaf Ashraf, um, that's just a touchstone at the starting point, the point of reference. Um, of course, there are many other layers of meanings and importance why the clients required that. So, yeah, let's not get carried away with the, that source where, where it springs from. That's really just like a, a takeoff point. It's, it's pretext, but an important uh, point of reference, certainly. I think much more important um, is uh, your other point about surat and mani and uh, what those monuments stand for and by the way um, amongst the things that I have learned uh, particularly regarding history is the complete misinformation that we have been uh, fed about history and the past and this notion of these moral, these feudal uh, tyrants. And just the other day I was reading um, Majid Sheikh's uh, article on these monuments being built on the blood and sweat of the masses. Uh, I, I, I'm, uh, amongst the lessons I've learned, and I continue to learn, is how wrong. We were just talking about um, the lady architects in the Mughal period, and uh, I mentioned uh, the example of Mai Bai. Um, she was the project director of one of the largest and most important projects of Lahore for the Mughal princess, uh, Rizwan Bhai, Zebra Nisa? Yeah. Jahanara. Jahan, Jahanara. 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 Oh, wonderful. Choburji. And, uh, um, you know, uh, we were struggling against the orange train and saying that the, the, the damage and disaster this will be for the monuments. And that struggle, that experience brought to light some very, very important things. And I really started to read when everyone was saying, why are you so concerned? What's the importance of these? So I thought, let me just find out what is the importance of these monuments. And we started with the Choburji. And on the entrance, uh, to that, that's a gateway that remains to what was a huge garden. It says, gifted to my by, by uh, uh, Begum, uh, whatever her title was. Zebinda Begum. Begum. Thanks. And then I looked up Latif and other documents. What, what, was, what does this mean? And what emerges was that this Zebunda Begum, probably the most powerful woman in the world at that time, decided to build this huge garden as the nobility did and appointed to supervise this huge project her maid servant. My buy. And when the garden, the project was nearing completion, she thought she'd pay it a visit. And along the way, she heard people in the street saying, there goes Zevanda Begum or what to my buy's garden. <laughs> that struck some chord in her. When she arrived at the garden, and my wife 
of course, came out with due adab and salams. And there and then, she gifted that whole garden to my bai. So these are these tyrants who built these monuments on the blood and sweat of the masses where it is a class-ridden, male, gender-dominated society. What rubbish! And just read the writings on the walls, right just along the, the orange tree. And you find um, Dayanga, a wet nurse, buried in this imperial monument, Gulabi Bagh. And right opposite, another tiny little but beautiful moral tomb, something that only the nobility could think of, Buddhuka Ava. Who on earth was Buddhu? Son of Sandhu. A potter. A Kumar. The lowest ranks of the Kammi Kameen. Who obviously became so rich building, providing the bricks for the monuments that were being built, that he was able to, or his followers were able to build this lovely little tomb. So this is a totally different picture that emerges. And I think those are the lessons that history can teach us. If we really bother to read the writings on the wall. Um, and one of the striking ways in which you distinguish um, uh, the idea of time as it works in, in, in building in, in the uh, Mumtaz tradition, maybe we could call it that, <laughs> is, is this whole idea of the recursive uh, idea of time. The time as building not as something that is generative as opposed to the, the modernist, this idea of building as new creativity, something that is coming into being, but building as a process of return, repetition, recurrence as you, as you uh, describe it. Um, and related to this, this idea of challenging how we understand tradition, uh, tradition as not a, some kind of a nostalgic return to, uh, to the past, but uh, tradition as uh, a way to articulate one's position uh, in the world. Um, and I think for me that was some of the most sort of inspiring, striking things to think also about, not just building, but also the idea of dwelling also as um, uh, not something that one looks to it in terms of, okay, we're doing something, looking to, uh, to move forward, but by inhabiting with this idea of recursivity, uh, it has its own, in a way, generativeness and its own kind of uh, creative uh, process. Um, that uh, turning to tradition, for example, you know, for my parents in, in, in dwelling in residence designed by Kamil Saab was, uh, yes, a certain kind of attachment to tradition, but tradition as a way of <laughs> articulating their new position in, in their social world. A dwelling that allowed them to connect both with life as they were experiencing it, but also to make sense of it by drawing upon uh, you know, a certain style, a certain aesthetic, a certain way uh, of, of, of seeing things. So I thought that was very sort of you know, uh, important in, in, in the book, um, and of course drawing from uh, your uh, um, own architectural practice of how to kind of think, rethink these categories of uh, building in regards to time and in regards to, to tradition. So, not a question, but if you could say more about that. So, I, I use that kind of dichotomy between generative and recursive in this book and also in an academic article that I published on Kamal Saab's work. But I've been, because I'm trying to write a, a more academic monograph on these architectural histories of Lahore, I've been kind of revisiting it and I actually don't know if it's, you know, I, I think. The juxtaposing generative and recursive is not necessarily helpful in exactly the way that you're saying that recursive is generative, right? Like to, 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 to kind of have a recursive relationship to time also through that act of repetition is generating new forms. So that's a kind of um, 
uh, I'm glad that you kind of raised that. But yeah, I think one of the challenges, especially for me in approaching this work, as someone who, you know, I guess has a, was trying to learn from Kamosado about what tradition means, because my kind of knee-jerk reaction as someone who was interested in revolutionary politics previously it was that tradition. Trash it all, you know, kick it all out, this sort of thing. Like, tradition is a regressive term, it's reactionary, etc. And I asked this, I put this to you in the book as well, like how do you, um, how do you kind of counter some of those critiques? And it's precisely through this very careful thinking about um, tradition as a way to inhabit the present um, and how to relate to history in a kind of way that, um, that recognizes the violence sometimes in just dismissing the past in pursuit of the future, right? I don't know if you want to maybe say more about, about that, about tradition and how you came to that language. Well, no, that's been part of uh, my yeah. re-education, my learning, and along the way, uh, the understanding of what tradition means uh, took on a very different mm. uh, meaning for me, like so many things. And just the very concept of time. Mm. Um, I had been brought up on the modernist notion of a linear time, about progress, development, evolution as an endless uh, goal and destiny of man. And then presented with this entirely other view of time. Essentially, that it is, it doesn't exist. The only reality is the present moment. And then this cyclic uh, notion of time or representation of time rather than a linear one. But this leads to so many um, revelations of what we are, where we are in time, where are we heading? And um, so the whole idea of self, of who are we? So what is normal man? And we tend to think that, you know, now we've, we're reaching our real potential and there's much more to come. So, and that this, this continuous evolution is normal. This is not the normative state. When you look at history, the whole of history, and you find that 99% of man's existence, that was the norm. And that was hunting, gathering. So it's a very different a picture. And then it becomes a very different guideline for the way we have to live in this world, in this moment. That perspective, where am I coming from? Where do I stand? Where am I headed? I think these are extremely, I mean, existential issues that we ought to be addressing. So there's so much that opens up. And all of that is part of how I understand tradition. You know, for, my, for the years of my students who are here studying Mughal architecture, could you say a little bit about your efforts uh, in setting up Anjuman Memaran uh, and then Haskanis and how are you know, these two bridging the gaps in our educational system where you know, there's been this alienation of our generations, uh, including many of us, you know, kind of not knowing how to read Farsi, not understanding the content, and just looking at taking things that they have, you know, the face value, investigating them in depth. Um, you know, what have been your thoughts spread over decades, efforts in reintroducing all of these, and how can we take it forward? Yes, uh, enlightenment. I think that that's what it has opened up. Uh, and why we uh, formed the Anjuman Mimaran? 
after we realize that what we need at this moment is to uh, change our orientation and learn from our past and our history and our traditions. And then we find there is no literature to teach from. So, um, so, so uh, we, this is the importance. I mean, it's not just a description of which emperor built which monument at what date and what is the length and height. All you get is, is our, whatever uh, from archaeology or whatever sources that I had to refer to when I was doing the architecture in Pakistan, all we, we could find was descriptive. There's no effort. There's not even the realization that there is any need to, as I say, to read the writings on the wall. So uh, learning, studying Mughal history or history, its importance is to give to, if it should lead to enlightenment, really. At least that's what it's done for me. And this book is the first book that's ever captured my attention like that. So I think it's wonderfully written. But I had a question about, so it's talking about historically what Pakistan, how we can preserve Pakistani architecture. But if there's elements that are used as starting points from Iran, from India, and then we also have elements borrowed from Uzbekistan, from Central Asian regions, and lest I sound like a simpleton, what really is Pakistani architecture then, and how do we categorize that in a contemporary sense and preservation? Thank you. We are sitting here very much, <laughs> particularly for this invitation, this book launch. I'm really thankful to Kavi Saab Natra. Uh, it was a wonderful event. And uh, I must appreciate uh, Chris because of the question he has framed as an interviewer. Those are wonderful questions. You can only frame this question when you knew very much about the personality, about the architecture, about the lifelong contribution of the personality, which he has very clearly defined and presented in his book. Uh, this uh, format of the book particularly has made a very interesting. If it is written in other some other format, that may be boring. Someone may say that if someone is saying about himself. But the questions and particularly the answers is a unique type of uh, you know methodology that has been adopted in this book. And uh, like a novel as fiction, when we start this book, you go to the end without any stop. This is the quality of this work. Uh, another thing is very important. Uh, in this book, we come to know about the various milestones of the country's life. And I myself think, when I have gone through the book, I came to the conclusion that uh, this was the time and the situation which has basically Kamil, uh, had, which has basically shaped the Kamil from Amtas up to this end. I will, I will explain in the way. Born in Calcutta, studying in Murray, came to Karachi, shifted to Essen College, went to England, then modern architecture movement, and then Khana, and then come back to Lahore, start working in, as a principal in NCA, and then got an opportunity for the World Bank project, that is a public project to provide the facilities to armed people, normal people living. And from there, he has got the various, uh, you know, visions about the normal people, uh, how they are living and how they are doing all this work. Then he got two very important projects, uh, Darul Ikhman and uh, then Chamba. I think those two projects has changed the total vision. And then come the Ajivane Memara, as he has explained, because there was a big gap between the architects who are studying in the uh, schools and the Memar who are working in the field. 
And believe me, till today, when the students go outside to the architect office or at the site, and they try to coordinate with the masons, they can't. That's a totally different world. But Anjumanim Mavara has created a very strong religion, and he basically realized that this is very important thing. Uh, the question is coming up. <laughs> <laughs> you have worked for the people, and you have recreated the buildings. You have not focused on the restoration or conservation of the old monumental buildings. And uh, of course, if you have that much knowledge, you can very much well done to that work. But you have not even uh, restored any historical building. It's not in my knowledge only that was uh, uh, the shrine near Miami. You tried for that. And then Masjid Wajir Khan to the extent. But you have basically studied those monuments. It is also a very unique study. Okay, you have studied the geometry. You have studied the techniques and have gone to, and then by using those, you have constructed mostly the residences. The low profile buildings are the very heavy monuments, and that is also is very close to your, uh, uh, you know, ideology of life that comes from the Gamonism uh, and then ends up with the Sufism. <laughs> so for one common thing is the people, because Gamonists also work for the not on and the Sufi also related to <laughs> My question is uh, why you, you have not uh, gone to the restoration projects and you have totally recreated all the, the, the wonderful buildings that you have created the ambience and there is uh, Surat and Mani both over there. So I agree with that but either it's a recreating of a history or it's a recreating recreation of uh, that involvement or that you feel that people may need this and uh, of course uh, you are very lucky having uh, good clients, no doubt. <laughs> because our clients are still, when client comes to the architect and says I need this Dubai building, he <laughs> says okay. When he says this London Tower, he says okay. <laughs> but you said no. And I know you have gone through a very hard time. Uh, during all the spectres. Uh, luckily, your Habib Hirali and uh, uh, Fawaz and all those your partners, they were also uh, working with you and they have their own style. So, this is my question, please. Uh, no, it's a very simple answer. I am not a conservationist. I am not a conservation architect. I am trained and I try to work as an architect. Uh, it just happens, the route that I've taken and uh, the little bits and pieces that I've managed to collect about traditional materials, forms, techniques, etc., that I think I've acquired uh, the notoriat not notoriety, <laughs> notoriety <laughs> of a con as a con people think that I'm a conservationist. They often, I'm, as you know, we, we've, uh, so, but I'm not, except uh, I am a conservationist, a, a traditional, not, not in the sense of conserving traditional buildings, but by conserving the tradition itself. Um, I was just going to say that I think the question about defining Pakistani architecture raised by um, some of the back there is just worth saying um, that I think it's a really good question and you point to the contradictions within it, which is that it's kind of an impo impossible um, thing to define as a singular object of practice, right? And I think as speaking as a historian, I always kind of refuse to talk about the history of architecture probably notice I say histories of architecture, right? It's always going to be plural architecture and its histories. Um, and I think the myriad of influences that you see from, um, from across the region, more broadly, are part of what makes um, 
you know, architecture is so interesting to talk to talk about. It's very rare to find a national style that is coherent. Um, it's kind of a myth that nations put about their own practices, but uh, with any sort of basic historical inspection, fall full apart. So I think as historians of architecture, um, that we kind of embrace that complexity and, and um, variability. So I just wanted to say that. So. I'd like to ask a question, but before that, just uh, a comment on the lighter side. So I have actually met someone who was considering having their house built by Kamsa, but they ended up going to another architect, and I asked why, and they said, Kamsa rejected us. I haven't read the book, but uh, knowing Kamsa, have an idea how uh, it unfolds, but I think from from the surface, the nice thing about it is a collaboration between a Western person and an Eastern person. So, especially for the younger people in the room, if you would comment a bit about how to approach scholarship and research, uh, you know, the Western method, the Eastern method, and maybe both of you would comment, maybe especially. Uh, person from the West, because you know we are all living in Western-dominated worldviews. So, you know, how have you navigated through that uh, conundrum to arrive at this uh, mutual collaboration? It's a difficult question to answer, and in, in, in that I, I'm not sure that I've kind of succeeded. Um, <laughs> I mean, first of all, I'm kind of wary of drawing the binary between East and West in a way, but then I'm also aware of the kind of um, dynamics that come from a Western researcher or researcher based in the West in that, I mean, it is a book that I've said is intended for students and for education and it's in English only. You know, if anyone would like to translate it into to Urdu or um, any other languages, they're more than welcome to. But some of the, the toolkits that I've been building on this website will be multilingual. Um, I learn as much from my colleagues in Lahore and in Pakistan um, when thinking about these questions. Um, I mean, I see myself again very much as a student here to, to learn rather than bringing in a framework. Um, you know, wonderful colleagues like Amin, like Ali Kazmi here, who writes on history and historical methods in, in Pakistan. Kamal is, I, I'm constantly learning from him. Um, and I think speaking of, I mean, I don't want to place this narrative on you, Kamasa, but um, Kamal grew up in a very westernized fashion, right? He, I mean, this is also a story of his move from studying in Atchison, going to London, being part of all these kind of hip London artist scenes and, you know, all of the, this kind of, um, and, and also learning to think beyond the framework that his education in the West um, uh, gave him. But I think, again, drawing that binary between Western and Eastern can sometimes miss the ways in which these histories are very um, intermingled um, and that a lot of things are, are shared between them in the birth of history as a discipline in architectural practice in the modern world. And um, that is a history of power. That is a history of um, uh, colonialism and global capitalism and all of these sorts of things um, that one of the things that I appreciate about Kamasap's work and his thinking is that he is extremely alive to these issues and thinking about the particularities of place and context rather than overarching frameworks um, uh, of knowledge uh, and so I think that's something that everyone can learn from, whether or not it's um, me coming from a university in London um, or uh, a student here in Lahore. But that's an inadequate answer, but just some way of thinking about it. I don't know if you want to say. I, I just want to um, tell you something which I think is very important for you. Um, you're a historian and you're looking for archives. Um, that's the person to go to. <laughs> he, he and his wife, Majibin Ali, and Majibin came to us with their house. And somehow, right at the beginning, 
they had a sense that this is something very exciting. So they maintained a diary, <laughs> a kind of scrapbook. And um, so that's, that's a real archive. Absolutely. I'd be very interested to see that. Do you want to pass that down? My first one is a very learning environment here, and I'm very glad that I'm here to learn. And uh, I, what I just want to say and share that uh, I was very fortunate as an architect that I grew in the shadow of Kamil Sam. He landed in Pakistan in '66, I believe. That time I was in third year, third, third, even fourth year in UET. And my professor, you know, talking the theories of architecture, he posed a question, uh, can an architect bring social change in the society? And me being uh, at that time a communist, <laughs> a Marxist, I said, yes, he can. That's what he should be. And almost half of my class said, what, what are you talking about? Policeman, he's not a policeman. As if the policeman is supposed to bring social change. That's the irony of the things. Anyway, so the topic given was just one class, class hour top topic. It turned out to be a great debate. And my professor called Kamsa. Yeah, you come over. He listened to the debate. We continued with him for almost like one week. One week. We used to sit outside in the lawns of the university. And then he said, Wait a minute, I have a friend who is working in Ghana and he is working on some United Nations project and let him come and he will probably. So the debate was supposed to have been actually accomplished in one uh, session, continued for almost like four weeks. And that is where I actually learned what architecture is all about. And I really admire this man we call Kam Kam Das to teach me that. And ever since, I have been very fortunate to have been part of his life, or he has been part of my life. Ever since I came back, when I started my department of architecture in Punjab University, I was completely resourceless. And uh, I remember, Kamusa was walking on my right side, and Nayar Dada was walking on the right. Both of them, they said, Dr. Saab, if you ever need any help, any help, we will be there for you. Help. That I took those all words for granted. And when I wrote the curriculum, I introduced the first time in any institution in Pakistan, I introduced the topic Pakistani architecture, architecture of Pakistan. And knowing Kam Saab, I sent my lecture to him requesting that he should be teaching that course. And Whatever reason, he said, no, I don't want to teach you, just go. <laughs> so I had to go myself. I sat down in front of him. I said, we had requested you to teach this course. And um, he said, why should I teach this course? I said, you have committed two mistakes in life, that you are bound to take this course up. I said, what mistake I I said, you have, first of all, written two books on architecture of Pakistan. So there's nobody else who can teach this course better than you. Uh, kind of, you know, he was speechless. I said, what is the second mistake I made? I said, you put your hand on my shoulder and said, whenever you need help, I'll be available. <laughs> and believe me, this is the greatness of this man. He did not raise any question. He said, where is the curriculum? Where is the coursework? I said, Time. I said, you choose the time. No, so you tell me the time. So eventually, he committed and helped raise our department of architecture to the level of one of the top three schools in the country. It is contribution to him because it is not the title, the course. It is the presence of a person who's got an aura. You see, uh, Dr. Shavas mentioned Surat Amani. <laughs> there is, between Surat Amani, there is another thing that goes on, the spirit, the root. 
And taking of uh, Dr. Kapil Shahzad's point, uh, why he has not been into conservation, well, I must say that he has been conserving the spirit of architecture that we have, we have had lost, and he's reviving that. So in many ways, he is the conservation architect, not in terms of putting up the conservation in the building, but the spirit. It's, I think it's amazing, it's really amazing and admiring that he has revived the spirit in such a way that people are now asking him to do that, what he wants to do. It's not a simple, uh, you know, it's not a it, it, It's an achievement of the order that only great people can achieve. So my uh, thanks to Kamil Sahab for being my teacher in my life and of course the teacher of so many in our life. But the one thing that really inspired me was that he has never said no to a reason, to a cause. Like, you know, Conservation Society in Lahore and we walked the city. But it's, we, we fought every year. And that is what his contributions are, that he has revived the spirit in us to take up the challenge of whatever the problems we have, we are facing, and stand up to that and do something constructive and creative. Well, I have to tell you salute you for that. <laughs> But people for whom the monuments were built, or the people who were supervising it, had their own viewpoints. Who kept their zaki? Do you think that we should not be afraid of the future? And in this way, the meaning will be one thing and not the other. So, how can we reach the meaning? That's my question. Is this not a question? Yes. Okay. 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 मेरे नाम से सबसे पहले तो आपको यकीन होना चाहिए कि माने भी होते हैं मुश्किल ये है कि फिर जमाना अब हम समझते हैं और यकीन है कि जो माती हकीकत है उससे इलावा और कुछ है ही नहीं तो जब आप एक चीज पे आपके आपको यकीन है वो चीज है ही नहीं तो वो आप कहा तलाश करेंगे और इधर तलाश करेंगे नहीं मिल सकते तो पहला पहली चीज है और अगर आपको समझ आ जाए तो फिर रास्ते में मिल जाए स्टार्ट एंड सेट एंड देन 
So in tracking our, our panel, um, you know, Chris, Salsa, Dr. Nadra, um, thank you once again for, you know, uh, really looking at this from so many different perspectives and offering your insights.